God welcomes all strangers and friends. God's love is strong and it never ends. God welcomes all. God welcomes all strangers and friends. sing lower notes, you might sing this. God welcomes all strangers and friends. God's love is strong and it never ends. Try that. God welcomes all. God welcomes all strangers and friends. God's love is strong and it never ends. Everybody singing the lower part. God welcomes all strangers and friends. God's love is strong and it never ends. Feel free to sing the lower part or the higher part or another part in your head. <laughs> God welcomes all strangers and friends. God's you, Deacon John White. So, a couple of housekeeping details that will help with our voting machines. First of all, I know that none of us has brought more than one personal electronic device. But in case people have several devices, if you could, if you're not using your devices for assembly business, please use the WCD free Wi-Fi network. Okay, we're kind of jamming up the network. The other thing that we've discovered is that none of you would have made it in the game, Mother May I. You don't vote until I say, please vote now. So some people are already voting, even though there's nothing on the little screen on the little device. And when we vote before they're ready for us to vote, that's what jams us the system or, or uh, prevents us from voting. So I, I'm announcing, please vote now, then you can press your buttons. But we don't have to do that just yet. All right. Um, for planning team purposes, uh, oh, so here we are. Um, we're gonna chain things around. Um, we're, we're doing really well. And the following uh, order of business for plenary session five is this is a proposal. The report of the vice president Greetings from invited guests, the college corporation meeting, report of the memorials committee, report of the reference and council committee, election results for the first ballot for secretary. Can we approve this order of business by consensus? Yes. Thank you. Seeing and hearing no objection, the amended order of business is adopted. We now turn our attention to the report of the Vice President and the report of the Church Council. I recognize and welcome Vice President Bill Horn. 
Thank you. Thank you, Bishop Eden. Before I get started in my report, there are a couple of things that I would like to do. First of all, I would like for you to reflect on the hymn we sang in worship today, Christ Our Peace. Reflect on these words, Christ Our Peace, you break down the walls that divide us. Christ Our Peace, come make us one body in you. In the first phrase, Christ our peace, you break down the walls that divide us. I'd like for you to think about not only what's outside of our church, but those walls that are inside of our church. The second thing that I'd like to share with you is that most of you know, or all of you know, that I am a public administrator. I am overwhelmed by the affirmation that I have received from you in the past 72 hours. Most public administrators don't receive that, that, much, ad, <laughs> that much affirmation. So I simply couldn't pass up the opportunity to say thank you. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for your grace and we pray for the presence of the Holy Spirit as we do our work during our churchwide assembly. Some of us are more experienced in church matters than others, but we're all equal in your sight and we all need a full measure of your wisdom. Bless us to be of one mind in you and help us all to be your presence in the world. In your name we pray, amen. amen. A reading from Galatians chapter three, verses 27 to 29. As many of you were baptized in Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. My assemblies in Christ, this reading speaks to me and to our relationship as Christians, Lutherans, members of the ELCA, and our relationship with our neighbors. The divisiveness that currently exists within our nation compels me to pursue a life of unity more than ever before. We face serious social justice challenges in this country right now. And my experiences traveling across this church are what have helped me keep my sanity in these divisive times. I have been fortunate enough to witness our members consistently emphasizing their unity in Christ as the common identity that we all share as Lutherans. The communities we serve challenge us to live this belief out in everything we do. When I am with you, I have felt your commitment and passion for social justice and it has, not, it has not only inspired me as a member of the ELCA, but it has made me feel very proud. I do not pass up an opportunity to tell people that I am Lutheran and to show them what it means to serve your neighbor. The past three years have increased my appreciation and understanding of how much our church demonstrates how we are church we are Lutheran, we are church together, we are church for the sake of the world. When you elected me in 2016, I felt called to be your vice president. I want to share with you a summary of what this call has been over the past three years. 
When we say we are the ELCA, that means the entire ecosystem of this church, including congregations, synods, the churchwide organization, and separately incorporated ministries. We need to strive for mutual appreciation across the ecosystem, and we need to do that together. God's Work Our Hands Sunday is a great example of a program that touches every part of the ELCA. Congregational members in my context really get it, and the bright yellow t-shirts draw a lot of attention. But what about all the other things that we do in the ELCA that expresses God's Christ's love in the world that go unnoticed? I encourage you to raise the volume of conversation in your congregation about the work our church does for the sake of the world. I want to specifically appeal to our pastors, deacons, and lay leaders to be the example of what it means to be the ELCA and pull and push the rest of us along with you. We're all quite eloquent at times, including myself, articulating the importance and significance of doing social justice and confronting all of the isms that hurt us. But we often don't want to dismantle or rework the framework that keeps us in bondage. I will be the first to admit it is painful to have discussions around race, gender, and diversity but we must have them. How can we recruit a diverse population of leaders if we can't place them where they are needed? Your church leaders wrestle with these matters, especially your bishops, and they need your help and support. Future Directions 2025 is a strategic document based on feedback from many of your peers throughout the church that captures the vision of our church for the future. It expresses how we imagine what God wants us to do. If you have not read the document, please do so and identify what excites you and how you would like to support it. More than ever, we need you to be involved. Lastly, I want to come back to this theme of oneness. I believe this is a very important issue. I can be of one mind with you and still disagree with you on an issue. When we focus on the word, the meaning of our baptism and the Eucharist, our life as Christians and our service to our neighbor, being of one mind helps us to navigate through the rough spots in living with each other. Paul's appeal to us in Galatians is an excellent roadmap for me to serve God with all my heart, soul, and the neighbor. The distinctions that I may make in our relationship and interactions won't ever overshadow the oneness we share in Christ Jesus. So as we continue to do our work during this assembly, please think about some of the things that I have shared with you this afternoon. Much has happened within our church, as you probably found out, reading through all the reports, recommendations, and memorials that are before you as voting members. My report is in Section 2 under the Report of Officers in the Pre-Assembly Report. In Section 11, you will find a summary of Church Council actions taken over the last triennium. However, this afternoon, I draw your attention to Section 5, titled Recommendations of the Church Council. These are the actions being brought forward to you by the Council. One of the first of these recommendations at this point calls for the election of the secretary to a six-year term by ecclesiastical ballot. 
This term will commence on November 1, 2019, and it is a six-year term. The recommendation further outlines the duties and responsibilities for that position. Related to this election, Church Council adopted a continuing resolution creating an identification process for the election of the Secretary. So hopefully, you as voting members were able to participate in this process by submitting names and potential nominees for Secretary. The next recommendation calls for the Churchwide Assembly to fulfill its responsibility to adopt amendments to the Constitutions, bylaws, and continuing resolutions of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Some of these were considered yesterday. Many of the amendments to be considered on Friday are housekeeping amendments. However, to make your thoughtful review easier, we have provided the rationale for each amendment as well. The next recommendation calls for the Assembly to adopt Faith, Sexism, and Justice, a Lutheran Call to Action social statement. This proposed social statement has been under development since 2012. There are two actions related to Assembly approval that consists of approving the social statement itself and then acting on the implementing resolutions. Yesterday, you heard an introduction to this statement, and last night in the hearings, you received additional information and were able to ask questions you may have regarding the statement. The next recommendation calls for the Assembly to adopt a declaration of interreligious commitment. This policy statement complies with previous churchwide assembly actions in 1989 and 1991 that required this church to develop an official policy statement describing this church's commitment and aspirations in its interfaith work. Bishop Eden established an ELCA interreligious task force in 2016 to develop this policy statement for your approval. Again, you received an introduction to this declaration yesterday. Another recommendation calls for the Assembly to approve certain social policy resolutions that have been reviewed and recommended to be archived under the policies and procedures of the ELCA for addressing social concerns. This review is initiated 25 years after adoption, and it included a variety of groups that included the Conference of Bishops. The next recommendation calls for the Assembly to adopt a strategy toward authentic diversity within the ELCA. The 2016 Churchwide Assembly required a task force be created and composed entirely of persons of color from regions and synods across the country to recommend a strategy toward achieving authentic diversity within the ELCA. The recommendations are designed to move the Church and its related agencies to act in deeper ways to achieve diversity aspirations. The last action listed is the budget recommendations for 2020, 2021, and 2022. The budget proposal in Section 5 of the Pre-Assembly Report provides information that includes a narrative description of the 2020 budget proposal and the process by which the budgets were developed. As you can see, the Church Council has been extremely busy this past triennium. You can read a summary of our meetings in Section 11 of the Pre-Assembly Report. We accomplished this work by meeting seven times in the past three years. These meetings are in addition to the countless hours of committee work, both in person and by conference calls. The Church Council met in a retreat setting in spring 2017, the res results of which made it a more collaborative group of decision makers and committed in achieving its governance responsibility. So much that for the first time in the history of the ELCA, we now have an ELCA Church Council Governance Policy Manual to assist us in being a well-governed, connected, 
and sustainable church. This achievement is in alignment with Future Directions 2025 that the 2016 Churchwide Assembly provided input to. The members of the ELCA Church Council are fine, dedicated, passionate, and committed individuals who have given so much of their time and talents to serve our church. If they all will please stand, I would like for you to join me in thanking them with a round of applause. And there are to my right. Thank you. In my printed report, you will get a glimpse of where I have had an opportunity to represent the ELCA in the past three years. I attended 10 Senate assemblies the past three years, and I look forward to attending many more during the next three years. In closing, a word of thanks to my colleagues, fellow officers presiding Bishop Elizabeth Eaton, Secretary Chris Berger, and Treasurer Lori Fedick. They're all blessed with gifts, skills, and passion in their cause as leaders of this church. And I want to thank you three very deeply for the opportunity that I have had working alongside you in serving God in this church the past years as the ELCA Vice President. Also, a deep word of thanks and gratitude for the tremendous staff for all that they do. They have supported me in every possible way. I don't have time to mention everyone by name, but I'm sure that you know who you are. We are indeed blessed to have such a devoted, talented team of folks whose passion is their work. And finally, I thank God and you too, members of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, for this extraordinary opportunity to serve as Vice President of the ELCA. Thanks be to God. The actions described by Vice President Horn will, be, will come up later at later points in the agenda and hearings this evening. Thank you, Vice President Horn. On behalf of this church, we want to thank you for your faithful commitment and generosity of time. This is not a paid position, and he has a full-time job as a city manager of the city of Clearwater in Florida, and they've had a few little rainstorms in the last few years. Um, but still gives his time to us. And, and Vice, President Horn, Vice President Horn also served on the, the task force that put together the Declaration of Interreligious Commitment. So you continue to serve the church, uh, serve the gospel well in your servant leadership, in your role, uh, in your role as Vice President of this church, and we are blessed. Thank you. Here is another resource available to those recognizing the 50th anniversary of the ordination of women. Thank you. This time I recognize three international guests with whom we are connected through the Lutheran World Federation. The first is 
the Reverend Dr. Oliver Schuegraf of the German National Committee of the Lutheran World Federation and the United Evangelical Lutheran Church in Germany. Second, I'm pleased once again uh, to uh, welcome to our assembly the Reverend Susan Johnson, National Bishop of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada. I'm older than Bishop Johnson, but she served as bishop longer than I have, and she's taller, so I'm sort of her little sister, as we say. <laughs> The ELCIC has been a treasured sister church, and for me, Susan has been my sister bishop, a companion, encourager, counselor, and friend in the office to which we have both been called. Last month, I was with her in Canada, first at her own national convention, and then as we both participated, participated in the General Synod of the Anglican Church in Canada. Together with presiding Bishop Curry of the Episcopal Church, we committed to hold one another in prayer through these times of decision for each, each of our churches. This four-way relationship has been a source of growing strength and joy as it deepens in cross-border friendships, collaborations, and commitments to shared mission. I'm delighted that Bishop Johnson will continue to offer her gifts of vision and leadership and especially happy that she was here to address us today. She just got reelected last month. <laughs> Bishop Johnson. I want to acknowledge uh, that we gather on the traditional Potawatomi, Ho-Chunk, and Menominee homeland along the southwestern shores of Michigamami, North America's largest system of freshwater lakes where the Milwaukee, Menominee, and Kinnikinick rivers meet, and the people of Wisconsin's sovereign Anishinaabe, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Oneida, and Mohican nations remain present. This land was part of Indian Land Session 187. It is a joy to be here with you today. And I bring you greetings from your siblings in Christ from coast to coast to coast that make up the part of the family of God that I serve, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada. I want to congratulate you, Bishop Eaton, on your reelection. My church has come to love you dearly, and they will be very happy to learn of this news. I want to thank you, all of you, uh, for the way our two churches partner together. Now that you are a church that's in its mid-30s, I think sometimes people start to forget our history. And the reality is that we as Lutherans in North America have come from church bodies, predecessor church bodies, that encompassed our whole geography. So that Canada and the United States had other Lutheran church bodies where we were together. And that through some weird Lutheran's process of meiosis and mitosis, we've ended up being the ELCA and the ELCIC. But there are many people, including me, who remember the time before. And I think that's a really important thing to continue to understand and to explain the closeness. I want to thank you for the ways we continue to work in close partnership. Uh, we work together as the North American region and the Lutheran World Federation. We're the only two churches in that region, so we really do depend on one another. We work together, as Bishop Eaton already mentioned, in the four-way where we're learning as churches in full communion in North America to find out what can we say and do together as churches as a sign of unity and a sign of hope for the world. Your bishops have invited my bishops for a number of years to the Bishops' Academy. Frankly, it's a wonderful opportunity for us to build collegial relationships with those who border on our territory but also, frankly, it's the only way I could offer that kind of continuing education to our people. So it's an incredible gift, and we give you thanks for that gift and for the partnership. I also want to say thank you for the incredible way that Global Mission continues to support and walk with us. 
um, at a time when we too are shrinking in size and numbers and, and financial resources, um, the Global Mission staff have been incredibly kind in helping us continue our ministry of global mission in the world. And many, many other ways where we're continuing to try and find out how we can partner and work together across this border that separates us. We have been praying for you. We have all been praying for you as you prepare to come together here in Milwaukee. And we are praying for you now as you meet so that God would bless you in your decision-making and deliberations. At our convention last month, we adopted a resolution to convey our support and solidarity of the, of the ELCA, of you, as you advocate on behalf of asylum seekers and detainees, especially your work to oppose actions that criminalize the right to asylum and that separate children from their parents. The Convention charged me to consult with you, Bishop Eden, and with your staff on the ways that we can ex best express solidarity and support. And I have a letter here that I'll give to you to share those actions with you. So, Miigwech, hi hi, hoa a, masi cho, marci, nakumik, thank you for your partnership, for the ministry we share. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bishop Johnson, and thank you for you and your church's continuing partnership here in North America. They adopted me in the province of Saskatchewan because I'm a Rough Rider fan, so that was, that was kind of fun. So. <laughs> now it's my honor and privilege to introduce you Archbishop Ponti Musa Philippus, Archbishop of the Lutheran Church of Christ in Nigeria and President of the Lutheran World Federation. He <laughs> He was elected by the 12th Assembly of the Lutheran World Federation in the 2017 Assembly in Windhoek, Namibia, as the Global Lutheran Movement commemorated the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, succeeding Bishop Munib Yunan of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Jordan and the Holy Land. Having served almost two years together with him as I'm the Vice President of North America Region, I have come to know, respect, and admire him as a colleague and a friend, and his courageous ministry and wise leadership. It's my personal joy to receive him as our guest and to welcome him to greet you as the president of the Lutheran World Federation. Thank you, presiding Bishop uh, Elizabeth Eaton, respected members of the ELCA bishops and church council respected voting members of this assembly, advisors at the church-wide assembly, respected ecumenical and interfaith guests, dear brothers and sisters, greetings to you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. It is with great joy and profound gratitude that I bring greetings of the Lutheran World Federation and the Lutheran Church of Christ in Nigeria that I'm called to serve as you come together to worship, to pray, discern, and decide together in this church-wide assembly. Thank you for the invitation and the opportunity. Let me first congratulate you, Presiding Bishop Elizabeth Ethan, on your re-election for a second term as Presiding Bishop of the ELCA. Congratulations. <laughs> what we saw yesterday was a clear statement 
from the entire church body about its confidence and trust in your leadership and service. It is my most earnest prayers that you may be inspired by this confidence and the Lord will grant you grace and wisdom as you continue to provide leadership in the years to come. We are church. This is the theme under which you gather, asserting with this theme the core of your collective identity. It is by God's grace, washed by the waters of baptism, inspired by the gift of the Holy Spirit, and livened by the word of God, that you have been made one to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ in word and action. We are church. The theme calls, first of all, for some response to the question, who will you be to your own people here in the United States of America who are longing for life in abundance, one that flourishes and thrives, one that is enabled to both embrace and express God's given dignity of all and each human being as a gift. You need to be the church here, both claiming your space and identifying the voice and witness you will offer in God's name to your own people in your own context. To be church is to feel fully embrace its contextual expression. And yet there is the other side to this statement as well. To be church is by fully embracing its ecumenical and global expression. Or let me use this theological concept here, its Catholicity. It comes with the nature of the church that it cannot be on its own, but needs always to embrace its larger expression. This church-wide assembly stands for this spiritual insight as the Lutheran World Federation does at a global level. Sisters and brothers, I come with a word of deep gratitude to you to acknowledge the amazing commitment and the many contributions the ELCA has made and continues to make to the Lutheran World Federation, the global communion of churches, including and such as accompaniment in mission theological work, ecumenical dialogues, development of a gender justice policy, service to the suffering neighbor in the world, and the Augusta Victoria Hospital in Mount Olive. All of that and so much more is part of your global witness and gift because of the ways in which you contribute with your leadership, your many gifts, and your resources to the LWF. Let me here particularly thank you, presiding Bishop Elizabeth Eaton, for your commitment and contributions to the life of the LWF in your capacity as the Vice President for the North American region. It is such a blessing for me, such a blessing for me as President of the Lutheran World Federation to serve with you in the Council of the Lutheran World Federation. I feel so blessed. I must also express prof profound gratitude on behalf of my church, the Lutheran Church of Christ in Nigeria, for our long-standing partnership with the ELCA, both at the church-wide level, but also at the synodical level with the Minneapolis Area Synod. We look forward to continued engagement and working together in God's mission. Thank you very much, dear sisters and brothers, and thank you all. Such a global witness that you offer as gift is more required than ever today. On a global perspective, 
our times are characterized by a dynamic shift of some, some foundational ground when it comes to shared values, to mutual accountability, to policies and principles once agreed upon for the well-being of humankind, to cooperation, to mechanisms to settle dispute and conflict. All these seem to be left behind. Fragmentation and withdrawal are so common today. Revisionism, for instance, regarding women's rights is a growing tendency. When we think we have made progress, we find out that we are actually two steps behind. Toxic language and discourse take center stage in public debates, leaving particularly those most vulnerable population in an even more precarious situation, and unfortunately, even within the church. Sisters and brothers, we know, we know this from history, that where aggressive language prevails, where hate speech is left unchallenged, where violence, we know where hate speech is left unchallenged, violence is just waiting to erupt. We must reject Thank you. We must reject these tendencies wherever they exist and insist on honest dialogue and embrace. We are the church locally and globally. This is a time not to retrieve, focusing only on our internal concerns and affairs. But to the contrary, this is the time to reach out. This is the time not to join the choruses of exasperation or fear and anger, but to continue singing the powerful melody of God's liberating presence in this world that sets us free to serve, to love, to reconcile, and to care. And here, I want to thank you again, Bishop Eaton, for how you spoke, together with other faith leaders, on the separation of families at the borders. Your words were a great encouragement to us all in the global communion of churches because this is a time not to be derailed from the message that is entrusted to us, but to draw from it and to witness to it in the midst of our broken world. As I end my greetings on behalf of the global communion of churches, your communion and the church that I represent, let me assure you that we stand with you as you conduct this church-wide assembly. We pray for the Holy Spirit to be present, to visit your hearts and minds, to open the ears to listen to each other, and to articulate the words you will be saying to each other. We pray for the Holy Spirit to guide your decisions, and in all of that, to root you deeply in God's word as spoken to us in Christ Jesus, setting us free to become witnesses of God's presence in this world. Grace and peace to you all. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Let's thank them again for their presence with us. I'm honored to serve um, with these two wonderful leaders. And if you would accept these gifts and maybe think of us from time to time, we'd be most grateful. <laughs> Let me turn off the microphone.
Let's stand and sing Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, page 26 in your worship and songbook. Portico Benefit Services is a separately incorporated ministry of this church that researches, designs, and provides benefits and resources to strengthen rostered ministers and lay leaders for ministry. I invite Pastor Jeff Tiemann, CEO and President of Portico Benefit Services, to introduce the video that will highlight the work of this ministry. Jeff. Thank you. Greetings, church. It is, it is a joy to be with you to represent Portico Benefit Services. Congratulations, Bishop Eaton, on your re-election. I am grateful for our partnership. Did you know that Lutherans first provided benefits for clergy and their families in this country over 200 years ago? We started in 1783, six years before George Washington was inaugurated as president. We are a church that takes care of each other. Portico is part of the church to serve this whole church. Congregational ministries, social ministries through Lutheran services in America, and higher education ministries, our seminaries, our colleges, and our universities. We are a church that changes. We adapt to meet the changing needs of our communities and our world. Under this banner, We Are Church, we're celebrating some of those changes this week. Change is at the core of our work at Portico. We innovate to control health care costs, to invest in ways that do good for our members and the world and to serve more people well. At Portico, it is our mission and our passion to continuously improve how we serve so we can do God's work as church together. Thank you. Enjoy the video. I'm so pleased to be here with you in Milwaukee and share in Conversations Worship 
in the important work of this church. As a missionary kid, I grew up helping my parents serve God's people around the globe in the Philippines and in Ethiopia. Service drew me to active lay leadership, seminary, parish ministry, and now Portico, where I've been honored to lead the ELCA's benefit ministry for the past eight years. I love seeing where the church has been and where it's going. Portico serves people across the ELCA every single day. We see how the church is changing and it drives us to continue to innovate and extend our service to strengthen ministry. At Portico, we're inspired daily by those who commit to a life of service. And we're grateful to walk alongside providing essential benefits and services. Thank you. I feel that my purpose is to serve God, but that means to serve others. Service is reaching out in God's name to meet the needs of other people. Service is the way that we act out and into our faith. A life of service is a journey. For more than 200 years, Portico Benefit Services and its predecessor ministries have been called to support the well-being of those who serve. We are in a community that has many needs. They have no access to health services. We have two clinics here. With one of the clinics, they can send people who need some kind of therapy to do mosaic. I feel we are doing the mission that we are called here. Portico helps staff at faith-based organizations serve with more confidence by providing innovative, cost-effective health and retirement benefits, life insurance, and disability protection. Loving God and loving people ultimately results in service. There are roles that I serve that are beyond the pews and beyond the church building. The bike and coffee shop has been a wonderful, important icon to the neighborhood and engaging young people. I'm a pastor of a congregation, which is a neighborhood of 4,000. Our Savior's housing serves people in this community who are experiencing homelessness. The English Learning Center serves newly arrived refugees and immigrants and gives them that critical skill that they need as they come into town. I believe that Jesus walks among us when we reach out to the poorest of the poor and when we welcome the stranger. Portico celebrates all those who commit to a professional life of service. The tens of thousands of people across the country who are right now building communities, caring for those in need, bringing people together. This is what we are as a community. Every piece is important. Every person has an important role to fulfill. Serving you so you can serve others. Thank you, Jeff. And nice socks. <laughs> As we move into the college corporation meetings, we do so with deep appreciation for the faculty, staff, and students at the 26 excellent institutions of higher education in the ELCA. I should probably name them all so you can all stand up and cheer for your, your alma maters, but we'll do that tonight, if that's okay. We know that the students sent to these schools will return as leaders in congregations, synods, the church-wide organization, and in the nation and throughout the world. Let me use this occasion to thank the many synod bishops, pastors, deacons, and lay leaders in this church for your diligent service as trustees or regents on the governance boards of ELCA colleges and universities. Thank you. The mission of the ELCA in higher education is overseen by an association known as the Network of ELCA Colleges and Universities. 
The network is a collaborative undertaking between the domestic mission unit of the churchwide organization and the colleges and universities of this church. It re represents the commitment of ELCA colleges and universities to strengthen themselves individually through collective work and to deepen their bonds with this church. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Philip Johnson, the president of Finlandia University and president of the network of ELCA colleges and universities to greet this assembly. Thank you, Bishop Eaton. Good afternoon. It is my privilege to greet the assembly on behalf of my colleagues, and we are delighted to be with you. And I also greet you on behalf of thousands of faculty, administrators, and staff serving on our 26 campuses across the church, who each year educate over 50,000 students on behalf of the ELCA. NECU, mentioned by Bishop Eaton, is a network that better enables us to tend thoughtfully and strategically to our shared identity as ELCA institutions, to champion Lutheran higher education, and to continue stewarding our relationship with the ELCA and its educational mission. We are convinced that our colleges and universities are consequential that what we do and what we aspire to become more fully, individually and collectively, matters to higher education in North America, to the Church, and to the world. We are here on purpose. Since the last churchwide assembly, the leadership of your ELCA colleges, now organized as NECU, have endorsed a shared statement on the vocation of Lutheran higher education called Rooted and Open, the common calling of the network of ELCA colleges and universities. Rooted and Open is our inspiration and our charge. It gathers our shared Lutheran identity into three expressions, called and empowered to serve the neighbor so that all may flourish. It commits us to excellence in the liberal arts, to vocational discernment and to radical hospitality shaped and informed by Lutheran theology and practice. And we lead in this way because we believe that now, as never before, the world needs the Church, needs our graduates, graduates who are intellectually acute, humbly open to others, vocationally wise, morally astute, and religiously sensitive. Our charge as leaders of your colleges and universities will be most fully realized, we believe, as we deepen relationships with congregations and synods with you. And so it is our hope that you will join us for this evening's reception at the Milwaukee Art Museum. Come. We look forward to welcoming you. And we are grateful for your leadership in this church and for inviting me and my colleagues to be with you this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, President Johnson. Under the leadership of President Johnson, the presidents of our colleges and universities who can be with us have been meeting today as the board of directors of the network. And here they are gathered at the front of the stage. And I'm pleased to call upon Pastor Mark Wilhelm, Executive Director for the Network of ELCA Colleges and Universities, to in introduce the presidents. Pastor Wilhelm. I am pleased to introduce the presidents of our college and universities who are able to be with us these days and gather as the board of directors of our Higher Education Association, the network of ELCA colleges and, and universities. Those present are Stephanie Herseth Sandlin, Augustana University, Chris Kimball, California Lutheran University, John Swallow, Carthage College. 
guess you're getting a sense of the geographical distribution on the floor, Bishop Eaton. Uh, Philip Johnson, Finlandia University. <laughs> Cantenning, Grandview University. <laughs> Rebecca Bergman, Gustavus Adolphus College. <laughs> Frederick Witt, Lenore Rhine University. <laughs> Jennifer Ward, newly elected president of Luther College. <laughs> Michael Maxey, president of Roanoke College. <laughs> David Anderson, St. Olaf College. Debbie Cottrell, newly elected president at Texas Lutheran University. <laughs> Susan Traverso, Teal College. <laughs> Michael Franson, Wittenberg University. <laughs> Bishop Eaton, we in the leadership of ELCA Higher Education are pleased to be with you and the assembly this afternoon. On behalf of the church, thank you all for your leadership. I've met almost all of you, and I think I have t-shirts from every one of your institutions. So. <laughs> thank you for your, your leadership, your commitment to, the, to Lutheran higher education, and your work to strengthen our shared mission. Join me in celebrating the work of President Johnson and his colleagues. The governing documents of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America provide multiple ways for a relationship to exist between this church and its colleges and universities. ELCA Bylaw 8.22.02 specifies one of them. It states that an ELCA college or university may relate to this church through a corporation, with a majority of the corporation's voting members being voting members of the churchwide assembly. Two colleges in Iowa have this governance, Luther College and Wartburg College. These, co well, you can give it up. These corporations are to hold their meetings in conjunction with a churchwide assembly, and we shall do this this afternoon. For their respective corporation meetings, Luther College will be represented by Dr. Jennifer Ward, President. Wartburg College will be represented by Dr. Daniel Kittle, Vice President for Student Life and Dean of Students. I now call them to the stage. I now declare the Churchwide Assembly in recess. And I call to order sequentially the meetings of the corporations of Luther College and Wartburg College. At this time, you as voting members of the churchwide assembly are serving as voting members of these corporations. You will wish to consult the reports and recommended actions for college and corporation meetings that were distributed with pre-assembly materials. The reports for the college and corporation meetings appear in the final section of the pre-assembly report labeled Other. After the representative of each college is introduced, we will proceed immediately to the action items listed in the reports. No motion or second is required for any action. Pastor Wilhelm will introduce the representative of the respective college at the start of each corporation meeting. The meeting of Luther College Corporation is now in session. Pastor Wilhelm. Bishop Eaton, I welcome to the podium Dr. Jennifer Ward, president of Luther College, to present the college's report and items for action. Bishop Eaton, voting members of the churchwide assembly now sitting as members of the Corporation of Luther College, friends and colleagues, I join you today as the 11th president of Luther College. I started in this role on July 1st, and I'm delighted to be back in the community of ELCA colleges and universities 
having spent many years at Gustavus Adolphus College as a faculty member earlier in my career, I'm pleased to be back in the fold and to have the opportunity to speak to the corporation so soon after assuming office. Following up on the written report submitted to the churchwide assembly by the 10th president of Luther College, Dr. Paula J. Carlson, I'd like to underscore that Luther is currently several months into a board approved strategic plan, inspired, empowered, engaged. As I reviewed the plan during my candidacy for the presidency, I was struck by the way in which it provides opportunities to demonstrate that Luther College is both grounded and global. Grounded in the town of Decorah, in the driftless region of Northwest Iowa, and with faces turned to the global community around us. Grounded and global, rooted and open, Luther is committed to providing an education that prepares our students to live and work faithfully in a world in which the project of civic sustainability cannot be taken for granted. I look forward to partnering with you to strengthen the ties between the high school students in your churches and Luther College. As you may know, Luther will match up to $1,000 per year of your congregation support should your student visit and then enroll at Luther as part of the Education Partners in Covenant grant. $2,000 per year shared by church and college provides demonstrable evidence of support for the education and formation of students who will both inherit and shape our communities, in addition to providing needed financial support to these families seeking the kind of experience Luther provides. Bishop Eaton, I now present Luther College's report and resolutions to amend Luther's articles of incorporation and to ratify the election of regents. Thank you again for the opportunity to represent Luther on in this day and in this body. Thank you. I direct you to pages one through three of college corporation meetings reports. Action items are, appear on pages three and four. The action items to amend the college's corporate, corporate articles and to ratify the election of regents. We will use the red and green cards for these votes. Pull them out now. If you are ready to vote, we will first vote on the resolution to amend the corporate articles and then vote to ratify the election of regents. Please hold up your green card if you approve the resolu resolution to amend the corporate articles and your red card, just for your green card if you approve. Thank you, those opposed? Passes, very well. Now let's vote to ratify the election of regents. Green card if you approve. Wonderful. Red card if you oppose. The meeting of Luther College Corporation is adjourned. Thank you. The meeting of the Wartburg College Corporation is now in session. Pastor Wilhelm. Bishop Eaton, I welcome to the podium Dr. Daniel Kittle, Vice President for Student Life and Dean of Students at Wartburg College to present the college's report and items for action. Thank you. I'm pleased to meet with you today representing President Darrell Colson and the Regents of Wartburg College. As Bishop Eaton said, students at Wartburg, including those from your congregations, serve after their graduation as leaders in this church, our nation, and the world. Thank you for sending us your teenagers to study at Wartburg College. Wartburg is pleased to be part of Lutheran Higher Education and its mission to educate students to be leaders who are called and empowered to serve their neighbors through their chosen vocations so that all people might flourish. In light of that mission, Wartburg College is undertaking many efforts for leadership development. This includes a growing collaboration with Wartburg Theological Seminary to construct a joint degree program that streamlines preparation for ordained ministry. Wartburg also strongly supports the newly formed network of ELCA colleges and universities. 
Our President, Darrell Colson, served on the network's executive committee during its first years, and he played a central role in the final shaping of Rooted and Open, the network's statement of Lutheran identity. We at Wartburg, including its Board of Regents, are delighted to affirm the statement in common calling and shared mission of the 26 ELCA colleges and universities. Bishop Eaton, on behalf of President Darrell Colson and the Regents of Wartburg College, I am pleased to present the Corporation the College's written report and items for action. Thank you. I direct you to pages five and six of College and Corporation Meetings Reports. Action items appear on page six. The action item is a resolution to amend the College's Articles of Incorporation. If you are in favor of amending the Articles of Incorporation, please hold up your green cards. Opposed, red. Well, that's been passed. <laughs> Thank you, the vote's approved. The meeting of the Wartburg College Corporation is adjourned. The meetings of the college corporations are adjourned, and I'll bet that was the shortest, least contentious board meeting you've ever had in higher education. <laughs> Thank you. We return to the assembly of the agenda. The churchwide assembly is now in session again. Before we move to, into our next item of business, I would like to introduce the leaders from our seven ELCA seminaries who are gathered here in front of us. Those present are Reverend Raymond Pickett, Rector of Luther, Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary at California Lutheran University. The Reverend Robin Steinke, President of Luther Seminary. The Reverend Louise Johnson, President of Wartburg Theological Seminary. The, Rev the Reverend James Neiman, President of the Lutheran School of Theology at Chicago. The Reverend Catherine Kleinhans, Dean of Trinity Lutheran Seminary at Capital University. Dr. Richard Green, Interim President of United Lutheran Seminary. The Reverend Mary Hinkle Shore, Rector and Dean of Lutheran Theological Southern Seminary of Lenore Rhine University. The ELCA is committed to identifying, preparing, and supporting faithful, wise, and courageous leaders through this church's seven seminaries. We thank these presidents for their faithful leadership in training and preparing rostered leaders to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Thank you very much. Fifteen Seventeen Media, Media is a separately incorporated ministry and the publishing house of this church. I invite Mr. Tim Blevins, CEO and President of Fifteen Seventeen Media, to introduce the video that will highlight the work of this ministry. Mr. Blevins? Thank you, Bishop Eaton. Well, good afternoon. Uh, I send my welcome from all my colleagues at 1517 Media in Minneapolis and several that are here uh, working at our booth in the exhibit hall and also assisting with worship, which has been such a rich experience these first several days of the, uh, of the assembly. Um, at 1517 Media, we create an incredibly wide array of resources to support ELCA congregations and ELCIC congregations as well. And through our ecumenical commitments, many of our resources serve full communion partner congregations as well. In addition, we just had the heads of our colleges and universities and seminaries here. We create resources for seminaries and institutions of higher education. And as you'll see in the video, we extend our mission to the family. So we create many resources that can be used in the family and 
for people, adult readers, for their own personal edification and faith development. So there is no way in the video that I'm about to show that we could ever cover all of these uh, materials that we create. We are showing a sampling in this video. If you'd like to see more of what we're doing, we do have a bookstore here in the uh, hall, which I hope you get a chance to visit. Thank Hello you to all from everyone at 1517 Media. As the publishing house of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, 1517 Media is committed to supporting the people of the ELCA. How? By offering a broad range of creative multimedia resources for both leaders and learners of all ages. We are focused on the breadth and depth of needs across the ELCA, which is why we don't just have one expression of 1517 Media, we have four. 1517 Media is made up of four distinctive publishing imprints. Augsburg Fortress, Fortress Press, Beaming Books, and Sparkhouse each offer distinct resources that help individuals and communities encounter God and grow in faith. Let's check out some of the many ways we can support your ministry. Let's start with Augsburg Fortress, which supports ELCA congregations in worship and music, faith formation, and congregational life. Take our Sundays and Seasons worship planning tools. Thousands of ELCA congregations use Sundays and Seasons each week to plan worship, selecting liturgy, music, preaching, and visuals from its planning library. And each year, dozens of ministry leaders throughout the ELCA create fresh and theologically rich content for Sundays and Seasons that can be used in a variety of contexts. Sundays and Seasons is one of the many ways Augsburg Fortress is upholding our commitment to resources created for the church by the church. Now, when it comes to our publishing imprint, Fortress Press, you might think it only publishes books for universities and seminaries. But now, in addition to serving higher education, Fortress Press has expanded its vision to offer a broad range of titles for all kinds of interests, roles, and needs within ELCA congregations. Books like Love Big by Rosella I. Day White. Love Big introduces readers to the power of revolutionary relationships, inspired by God's love to heal the brokenness in our lives by reaching out to others. Elders Rising by Raleigh Martinson draws wisdom from many seasoned contributors on understanding the role of elders in our communities of faith. And Reverend Lenny Duncan offers the church a bold new vision with Dear Church a love letter from a black preacher to the whitest denomination in the U.S. Each year, Fortress Press releases dozens of books written by authors who help readers broaden their perspective and grow their faith in new directions. Publishing these books further extends our commitment to providing resources for the church by the church. And we don't just publish enlightening books for grown-ups. Our newest imprint, Beaming Books, publishes high-quality children's literature that help kids thrive emotionally, socially, and spiritually. There's No Wrong Way to Pray by Lutheran pastor Rebecca Ninke and her daughter Kate Watson explores talking to God in the everyday moments of life with humor and honesty to reassure kids that the way they pray is okay. When Charlie Met Emma by Amy Webb tells the story of a young boy meeting a girl with limb differences and learning that people being different isn't bad, sad, or strange. Different is just different, and different is great. With this growing collection from Beaming Books, congregations can offer families many creative ways to talk about faith, values, and community with their children. And for your congregation's faith formation ministries, we have our fourth imprint, Sparkhouse. Sparkhouse works with creative collaborators to design curriculum for Sunday school, confirmation, youth group, and adult learning, all focused on meeting the needs of your congregation. Every Sparkhouse resource is designed for the church by the church, and that is exactly how Sunday school curriculum, like Whirl, came to be. Whirl creates a vivid story world with irresistible characters. Do you know how long the Bible is? A billion pages! On a scale of 1 to 10, I would give those prayers an A+. The World Kids help make connections between worship and Sunday school. This is just like what Pastor Pete said in his sermon this week. Oh, the word about Zephaniah? Exactly! With its combination of lively storytelling and relevant faith messages, kids of all ages love world, and so do their leaders. 
That concludes this whirlwind tour of the four imprints of 1517 Media, the publishing house of the ELCA. We look forward to our ongoing partnership and ministry with you, creating resources for the church by the church. 1517 Media, how can we support your ministry? We will now continue with the report of the Memorials Committee. So I call on the co-chairs Reed Christofferson and Cheryl Chapman to come up. And please remember where you were in the queue. We will be continuing our discussion um, about whatever we were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sanctuary, yes, of course. Sorry. Is it still Wednesday, is it? Very good. So could you, you line up, folks, where you were? Do you remember? you. We are considering the motion as amended. Microphone 12. Brian Campbell, Western Iowa Senate. Just a reminder, when we vote with the cards, be sure you only have one card so you don't get the wrong vote. Okay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Microphone four. Thomas Asigard, Oklahoma State, o Oklahoma, Arkansas, Oklahoma Synod, and member of the Memorials Committee. Uh, Sitting in the Memorials Committee meeting yesterday, I was very excited to hear this amendment proposed. Um, as a young adult living in a part of the country that is often unwelcoming and unloving towards so many, I love that our church is wanting to move forward in being a loving church body by labeling ourselves a sanctuary body. However, that excitement was made much more apprehensive shortly after, as it was explained by support staff that the word sanctuary is not well defined and that the assembly does not have the authority to push synods and congregations of the church to take on the actions that many perceive a sanctuary to entail. This puts us as a church in the position of having the title of a sanctuary body while not all parts of the body are willing to participate as a sanctuary facility. This troubles me in that people may come to an ELCA church thinking that they will have help awaiting them where in fact, none may be waiting for them. Ethically, I take issue with making a promise that does not have distinct bounds and that our church as a whole cannot keep. If our, chief, if our church feels that we are ready to make this promise, this memorial cannot just be words. We must have a conversation that must range from upper church all the way down to the synodical and congregational level. The label of sanctuary body should not come as empty words because of this, I'm very apprehensive to make this amendment. Thank you. Speaking for the amendment? I mean, speaking for the motion. Is there a speaking in favor of the microphone seven? And then we'll come back. We'll come back to you next. Microphone seven. Bruce Osterhout, uh, Northeastern Pennsylvania Synod. I'm from the diverse county of Berks, the city of Reading, in eastern Pennsylvania. Our county is home to the to ICE's Family Resident Residential Center, and in our county there are congregations that are older than the United States of America. Martin Luther said that God works through three institutions: family, church, and government. And when the government fails to do the right thing, the church needs to step up. The world is in need of a hopeful message amidst all of the hate and injustice and intolerance that's out there. We don't need to worry about the definition of the term sanctuary. We just need to step up and help our country figure it out. We need to step out in love 
and not be afraid. We need to be bold and throw our weight, the weight of our expertise of 80 years of resettling refugees and immigrants. We need to advocate for justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Microphone 12. I just had a point of clarification, Madam Chair. We've been discussing uh, what is the definition of refugee versus immigrant versus migrant and um, how we should clarify that. And I believe we should use the definition set forth by the United Nations that's recognized internationally for those terms. Refugees are forced to flee to save their lives or pre preserve their freedom, but migrant describes any person who moves usually across an international border to join family members already abroad to search for livelihood to escape natural disaster or for a range of other purposes. But any refugee, so basically a refugee is somebody who has been forced to move versus somebody who chooses to move, but all are migrants. Thank you. Microphone 11. Thank you, Lori Larson Caesar, Oregon Synod. The Oregon Synod three years ago, after much deliberation, voted to become a sanctuary synod. And I would just love to um, put to rest some of the fears and anxieties. We pondered also what the legal definition of sanctuary is, what the theological definition of sanctuary is, what the ethical definition of sanctuary is. And finally, we decided that adaptive leadership requires us to step out in faith and boldness for the sake of a gospel of liberating love, even when we can't define precisely or legally what that means. And in the three years of living into being a sanctuary synod, what we have discovered is no congregation has shared that they felt pushed to do anything they don't want to do. No congregation has been required to have a shower. Um, many congregations have engaged in conversations they would not have otherwise. Many congregations, because of the leadership of the voting members of the Oregon Synod, have been involved in conversations and also declared themselves sanctuary. We've been more active as Christians, and there has been almost no... Um, there have been very few negative ramifications, honestly. I've only been the bishop for six days, but <laughs> so what do I know? But what, what I have seen has been immense and amazing and transformational, and it's because we listen to our young leaders, we listen to our leaders of color, and we've strengthened our muscles of taking risks for the sake of gospel and liberating love. So I hope that as a body, we as a denomination can declare ourselves sanctuary so that we too can strengthen our muscles for a gospel of liberating love. Thank you. Thank you. Microphone eight. Thank you, Madam Chair and women. I rise in opposition to this amendment. Can you tell us who you are? Yes, I apologize. My name is Dave Tyndall. I'm with the Northwest Wisconsin Synod. Uh, I would gather, I would, I would assume that virtually everybody here in this hall, including myself, who is an American citizen, is either an immigrant themselves or a descendant of an immigrant, as I am of German and English citizens originally. Uh, one of the things all people learn upon coming to this country and becoming citizens, and I have met many new citizens myself in my work, are three words that I uh, remember hearing from the lady from Washington State who spoke this morning, rule of law. The rule of law is clear when it comes to immigration. It may not be the law that we necessarily like, and it may not be enforced the way we would necessarily like, but it is still the law. We must be mindful of that as we consider situations like this. We are the church. But we are also the government. When we want something to be changed in this country in terms of a law, we have the means to do that through our elected representatives. They may not always respond the way we would always like, but they are these things called elections that we have. So I would urge all members of this body to prayerfully consider that if we want to see the situation change so that no sanctuaries will ever be necessary anywhere, we must remember first the rule of law and second that we have the ability to change the law if it needs to be changed. Thank you. Thank you. Microphone seven. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Yoder. I'm from the Western North Dakota Synod and my pronouns are she, her and hers. 
Uh, first off, I want to point out that the definition of sanctuary is on page 24 of the Memorial Committee's report. It's defined as a response to raids, strategy to bite individual cases of deportation, a vision for what our communities and world can be, and a moral imperative to take prophetic action of radical hospitality. So, and this definition is vague, but I think that vagueness is important. Where I'm from, in Dickinson, North Dakota, there are hardly any immigrants, let alone refugees. What it would mean for my congregation to be a sanctuary congregation is something significantly different than it would mean for a congregation on the border. This, this vague definition allows each congregation, if they so choose to be a sanctuary congregation, to be a sanctuary in the way that they best see fit. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, please, let's remember we're talking about the entire motion, not just the amendment. Because it's already been amended. Okay. The whole thing now. All right. Microphone one. Pastor Don Roginski, Sierra Pacific Synod, and my pronouns are they, them, there. Um, we've been talking a lot about rules and policies. I want to put a human face on this. I'm going to tell you a story. And this is a story about Tony, who first came to my congregation because he saw our rainbow flag outside. He came up to me in tears after worship, said, I, I can't believe there's a place for me. Tony is a young gay man from a country in Africa where it is still illegal to be gay. And as we learned more of his story, he lost his housing. So we took him in and we have provided a place for him. And it has been such an incredible gift for us in addition to providing a safe place for him to be. We have to decide whether or not we're going to think about policies or people. If Tony goes back to his country, he will be killed. He had been beaten before he came here. And his partner continues to face abuse and their uh, place of where they live was ransacked. Please think about the people. Thank you. Microphone five. Marin Holden, Minneapolis Area Synod and an outgoing member of the ELCA Church Council, pronouns she, her, hers. I move to amend. Go ahead. At the end of the text on the screen, I would add. Phone won't open. To request that the ELCA Church Council in consultation with the appropriate church-wide units and offices, provide guidance for the three expressions of this church about what it means to be a sanctuary church body and provide a report to the 2022 church-wide assembly. Is there a second? Second. Let me speak to your amendment. Thank you. And just as a note, the text on the screen does not quite match what I just said, but I think you have the text of what I just said. And if you don't... So, to speak to my amendment, um, I've heard the calls today from many members of this assembly feeling the push to show our radical hospitality grounded in our Christian tradition. I've also heard some consternation about what this means and what this looks like at a congregational level, a synodical, and the church-wide expression in our denomination as a whole. And so, I offer this amendment as an option for the assembly if you choose to move forward with the entire motion. Um, to enlist the assistance of the church council in providing guidance to the whole church about what this taking this action means. Thank you. Is there any speaking to the amendment? Where's the microphone? Microphone five. Clarence Smith, member of church council from the St. Paul area synod area synod. Uh, Reverend Chair, I rise to speak in favor of this amendment. As has been noted in this assembly, there is not a common definition for the term sanctuary church body. In fact, and within conversations in the um, <clears throat> Memorials Committee, we had even come to the conclusion that perhaps looking at the resolution before us on the screen, that all the attributes of that resolution 
may in fact define the term sanctuary church body, but it's clear that some may agree with that and others may not. For this reason, I support the amendment that has been proposed. Thank you. Any more speaking to the amendment? Microphone 11. Lori Larson, Caesar Oregon Synod. I just want to agree with that, that having had, um, I wish Oregon had had tools that would have helped us discern how to move into that. What we discovered through our three years was some, some congregations could be advocates, some could be helping other congregations who had people living there. Um, some congregations joined Amparo, some gave big gifts to global missions. There, there are probably 10,000 ways to inhabit this, and it would be lovely to have some of the tools laid out if we make this decision. So I'm in favor of this amendment. Thank you. Any more speaking to the amendment? Microphone three. Uh, yes, so uh, Pastor Peter Olson from the Arkansas Oklahoma Synod. Uh, so I had originally voted against the amendment to include sanctuary, and the reason why was not because I'm against providing by any means. My concern is the amount of education that we've done around this before we go ahead and claim the title as being a sanctuary church. Uh, I was actually going to propose a very similar um, uh, movement to this, so I very much appreciate that. Um, I think we as the ELC are very uh, gifted with the ability to be a both and church, right? So we have the ability to both serve those who are in need and help inform our own members as well. I think the more that we can work towards this, uh, to be very intentional in the way we, we care to these issues, uh, that we understand both sides of the issues and get information that's uh, out there, available, and uh, very easily accessible to the population. I think that's incredibly key as we move forward into this. So thank you. I highly support this. Thank you. Is this speaking to the amendment? I guess that you're speaking about it, sir. Microphone four. Tom Salver, Southeastern Pennsylvania Senate. I wish to speak against it, the amendment, because I think we need to take action now as a church body, not wait for three years. We have a crisis in this country. The faces is what we need to remember, not polity, not policy. So even though um, this whole thing is very positive, I don't want to wait three years. We have an urgent need right now. Thank you. Thank you. Microphone eight. We have 80 years of expertise. Please, please introduce yourself. Bruce Osterhout, Northeastern Pennsylvania Synod. Thank you. We have 80 years of expertise in the Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service. Our congregations are already fully engaged. People are suffering now, people are dying now, and it's a national issue. We need to speak out now and today. Thank you. Is there further speaking to the amendment? Microphone three. Thank you, Paul Bonesack from the Minneapolis area Senate again. I'm speaking in favor of the amendment. I had a concern that we were maybe putting the cart before the horse, uh, the way we tacked that on before the study was actually held. So again, I speak in favor of the motion. Thank you. Is this speaking to the amendment? Microphone 11. Brian Moss, Nebraska Senate. I rise to call the question. Thank you. Is there a second? This is not debatable. Um, all in favor, raise your green cards and your green cards only. This is the motion to call the to end debate on this amendment. Got it? Okay. All right. Those opposed? Thank you. The the, the motion to call the question is uh, has passed. Uh, now the um, this amendment to the amended memorial. This amendment is now before us. So I think you need to go. We're going to vote on, on that. And I need my voting card. If someone can hand me my thing. So go back to your voting machines. We'll try a voting machine thing. Now remember, don't press anything until I say, please vote now. Takes a bishop to uh, takes a village to raise a bishop. Thank you very much, Pastor Swick. Let's hear some more. 
Okay, so now, if you are in favor of the motion, of the amendment, pardon me, you'll press one, not yet. If you're against the, the amendment, you'll press two. Please vote now. Have we resolved the issues with the voting machines yet? Oh my. Okay, folks, let's try this. If you're in favor of the amendment, please raise your green cards now. Thank you. If you're opposed, red cards. The amendment is passed. Now we're back to discussion on the amended uh, memorial, which is before you now. Is there speaking to the whole thing? Yes? Microphone three. Eddie Kim, lay member of the La Crosse Area Senate. I speak in support of the main motion and wish to speak to two concerns we heard earlier by way of analogy. First, we heard the concern about the definition of sanctuary, so here's the test. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, and the Spirit who sends us forth. Amen. By way of analogy, how many confirmands in your parish can give an Athanasian Creed-approved treatise of the Trinity? Even if some of your youth might not be perfectly able to do so, they would know how to respond to that Trinitarian blessing. Even when definitions aren't precise among us, we still know how to do church and how to be church. Second, we debated the number of showers in the Chicago office building. I appreciate the desire to address implementation, but if we did that only, we would never accomplish the mission of the church. If the Metropolitan New York Synod and four sister synods can be sanctuary synods, then this can be mirrored successfully at the churchwide expression. When a crowd of 5,000 showed up, the disciples retorted about the scarcity of resources. Counting few showers to thousands of migrants is our modern version of, but we only have five loaves of bread and two fish. We need to hand over our few showers to Jesus so that we can be divinely empowered to serve the multitude. How do we deal with having only two showers on West Higgins Road? I don't know, but I believe God will provide. Dear siblings in Christ, if we believe in the radical part of radical hospitality, then we must walk in faith to trust that God will provide the bread loaves, the fishes, and even the showers. Thank you. Microphone four. No, come on. Microphone four. We'll wait. Okay. Pastor Ann T. Meyer, Metro New York Synod. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I call the previous question. Is there a second? Second. All right. If you're in, this means that debate will stop and we'll move to vote on the amended uh, memorial. Clear? Those, uh, okay, microphone 12. Matthew Regal, West Virginia, Western Maryland. 
Point of information, how many speeches have been given on the amended main motion in both the affirmative and the negative? What, 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 what do you want to know about, Matt? <laughs> Since the motion has been most recently amended, how many speeches have been given in the affirmative and how many speeches in the negative? So one. We, have, we have had one speech on each side. Yes. Satisfied. That's right. I think you're just helping to us to inform our vote on whether or not to close debate. We got you. Okay. Now, if you're ready to vote, those who are ready to close debate, do you have a point of order, microphone three? Microphone three? Katie Schnapp, Southeastern Pennsylvania Senate. Um, I just want it to be perfectly clear because it sounds like there's a lot of confusion. Nobody is being forced to do something, correct? This is not a point of order. It was a question. It's not appropriate this time. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so now, those in favor of closing debate, hold up your green cards. Those opposed to closing debate, hold up your red cards. It's closed. And now we'll move immediately to vote on the entire amended motion. All right, those in favor of the amended memorial before us, please raise your green cards now. Those opposed, your red cards. Thank you. It's adopted. Thank you very much. I'll call on uh, Ms. Chapman and Mr. Christofferson, and we're going to move to consideration of some more, more memorials and uh, since we're a little bit behind, just to let you know, this section on memorials discussion for this time is going to close at 445. Ms. Chapman. Okay. The next memorial for consideration is category, category A2, Peace Building, which reads, to receive with gratitude the memorial from the Sierra Pacific Senate concerning the creation of a U.S. Department of Peace Building, but to decline to take action at this time. I so move. All right, that's before you. So what's bef before us is that, you're, that the Memorials Committee is declining to take action. Yes, that's We decline to take action. That's debatable. I mean, I mean, technically, that's debatable. <laughs> Microphone one. Uh, yeah, hello. Uh, Josh Hayes, Sierra Pacific Senate. My pronouns are he, him, his. Um, sorry, let me get this here. Uh, I move to uh, amend the recommendation, uh, which currently says uh, that uh, to decline to take action. Uh, and I move to amend it to, uh, to receive with gratitude the memorial from the Sierra Pacific Senate concerning the creation of the U.S. Department of Peace Building and to take action as stated in the resolves at this time. Thank you. Is there a second? You may speak to your amendment. Thank you. Um, so in the, in the background given, uh, there's, there's discussion uh, against, the, um, against taking action saying that uh, this legislation is not being widely considered at this time, uh, and also um, that the current lack of uh, support in Congress uh, makes it such that uh, the declining to take action. Um, it is uh, stated in the Future Directions 2025 Goal 4 that a visible church deeply connected to working ecumenically with other people of faith for justice, peace, and reconciliation in, in communities around the world um, is one of the goals that we aspire to. Um, I, I think that a way to do this is to bring this um, memorial forward, which calls for us to uh, reach out to uh, not only uh, 
community advocates that we are in, uh, in communication with, but also specific House of Representatives uh, representatives to voice the ELCA's support for H.R. 1111, uh, which calls for the creation of a cabinet-level Department of Peace Building uh, in, the un in the United States. Um, this bill, which is proposed in the House, 85% uh, of it, uh, the funding for this bill, would go to uh, domestic violence prevention. Um, and in, in a week where this past weekend we've had two, or was it three, uh, mass shootings, um, in, in 250 in this year, I think that in order for us to really be the ELCA that we claim to be and want to be and voice our opinions in the public square, as Bishop Eaton said, that we need to voice this to Congress as proposed in the results. Thank, Thank you. you. Any further speaking to this amendment, which is before you? Seeing none, are you ready to vote? Those in favor of the amendment, green card? I'm sorry? Are you speaking to the amendment? Yes. Okay, microphone one. Uh, Pastor Don Roginski, Sarah Pierce, Pacific Synod. Mm -hmm. uh, my pronouns are they, them, theirs. Um, I stand to speak in favor of this amendment. Um, one only has to turn on the news to see um, the need for something like a peace building office. And as a church, we can be the ones who are prophetic and putting this forward in front of the Congress now, not waiting for later. Thank you. Any more speaking to the amendment? Now I think we're ready to vote. Those in favor of the moment of the amendment, please raise your green cards. Thank you. Opposed your red cards. Oh dear. Let's try the machines. <laughs> now don't don't do anything until I tell you. All right. Let's try this. All right. Those in favor of the amendment, please press one. Those opposed, press two. Please vote now. Voting is closed. Can we see the results? The amendment has failed. Thank you. We're back to the original recommendation. Is there any further speaking to that? Do you understand what we're, what we're doing? Yes? Okay. All right, are you ready to vote? Good. Uh, we'll, we'll keep working with the voting machines. That was, that was good. Okay. Those um, in, in, in favor of this will press one. Those opposed will press two. Please vote now. Voting is closed. Let's see the results. All right. The motion is passed. Thank you very much. Mr. Christofferson. We turn our attention to Memorial Category C1, Church and State, found on page 43 of your Memorials Committee report. Recommended action to receive with gratitude the memorial from the Minneapolis Area Synod requesting a social statement on the role of government, the nature of civic engagement, and the relationship of church and state, and to authorize the development of an ELCA social statement on government, civic engagement, and the relationship of church and state in accordance with the policies and procedures of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America for addressing social concerns dated 2018. Bishop Eaton, we move this action. 
Thank you. It comes from a group, so there's no need for a second at this point. Is there any speaking to this memorial? No. Are you ready to vote? Wait. Hold on. That's okay. Microphone eight or twelve. Microphone twelve. Then eight. You first. Steve Herr, Lower Susquehanna Synod. I had a question uh, to ask how the implications of this action would impact the twenty, the next triennium budget proposal. Well, that's a very good question. I wonder if our treasurer is prepared to answer that question, or perhaps executive for administration. It's going to cost something. You're right, Pastor Her. We're going to get the answer for you in a minute. Pastor Bullock. Yeah, why that a Bullock? Um, over the development of a social statement that we've had in the past, it's about a five-year development, and that's around $300,000 and there could be other costs as well. Thank you. Is there speaking, I think microphone eight. Patricia Lall, St. Paul Area Synod. We've heard in our worship life about the prophets of old, the teachers before us. I believe that St. Paul and Martin Luther and many others, neighbors included, have spoken in a social teaching manner and that we are an empowered both lay and uh, rostered theological community out of which we have resources available without need for a five-year process with a new social statement uh, on church and state. Thank you. Microphone 12. Mark Parker, Delaware, Maryland Synod, 8F, he, him, his. Uh, following up on that, both the last two points, um, there were four different memorials which called for our action to approve a social statement. Um, uh, the memorials committee decided to recommend this one go forward um, and declined the other three, in part because of a concern about the lack of resources uh, or the amount of resources necessary to carry forward a social statement process and the desire to focus on one at a time. Uh, given the previous comments about the nature of our statements and I would say the, the general concern, the importance and yet the general concern um, raised by this request for a social statement, I would simply suggest that maybe uh, there might be other uh, memorials before us, for example, the one on migrants and refugees calling for a social statement process to begin that might be more pressing and might be more in line with the other actions taken by our assembly at this point in time. And so while I believe that we ought to be doing more than one at a time, if we are going to choose one, I would suggest one that is more focused on a particular area of ministry and social concern than a more general one lifted up by this uh, proposal. Thank you. I'm going to call on the resource mic for the Reverend Dr. Weveta Bullock. She has some more clarifying information. Just to say that the current uh, triennial budget does include the funding for the development of a one social statement. Thank you. Microphone three. Yes, Bishop Ann Svenningson from the Minneapolis Area Synod. I recognize that we need to be very careful stewards of every dollar that is given to support the mission of the church. I believe that one of the great crises we face right now in our country is the role of government and how often we hear from people that we want less government, no government, what is the use of government. Luther had many incredible things to say about the positive role of government, about how God works through that aspect of our world. And we have something, I think, very valuable to contribute to what's happening in the political landscape of our country right now 
and I think this is a worthy investment, a way we can bear witness to God's work through political structures for the common good. Thank you. Microphone 12. Pastor Nathan Metzger, Nebraska Synod. Um, my, the, my colleague who spoke at this microphone previously has already stated um, things very eloquently already, as has the, the bishop who spoke against this prior. Speaking for myself, I, I have to make a confession, uh, sisters and brothers in Christ, as we come to the prospects of another social statement, a part of me sighs deeply, um, knowing what going through these processes have caused in my, the area in which my congregation is located um, and the upheavals that go along with it. it as has been previously said, um, we can already draw from the scriptures um, on ways to go about doing this, and we can do these things from a grass, in a grassroots way, um, contacting our own government officials as we discern necessary without having to go through the pro this five-year process and spend these resources that might be better spent elsewhere. Thank Th you. Thank you. Microphone five. Joe Nolte, uh, Church Council, uh, Memorials Committee, and uh, Southeastern Iowa Synod. Uh, could I uh, ask Roger Willer, our Director of Theological Advisory, uh, to um, give some background as to um, the process uh, for discernment around this social statement and, uh, and, and that he and the Memorials Committee has used? Yes, you may. Thank you. Pastor Willer. Thank you. I, uh, I am the Director for Theological Ethics, and um, my bailiwick is the development of our social teaching and policy documents. Um, I want to say a couple of things I think will help in terms of uh, information education. We have two ways that we provide social teaching to our church. One are social statements, and the second are social messages. Social statements, uh, according to policies and procedures for addressing social concerns, address the large social institutions of our time. Social messages are much more topical, and because the social statements address those large institutions and the larger theological issues, um, they require the five-year process. Social messages uh, can be done more or less in a year. The reason um, that this particular social statement um, seems appropriate, or seemed appropriate to the church council is that it addresses one of those great social institutions which, um, as has previously been said, is in crisis. And it um, does, will do that in a way that involves the participation of our church in engaging those kinds of questions and going deep into that just as the previous social statements have done. Some of the other uh, requests for social messages or social statements are really uh, uh, more appropriate to social messages which uh, depend on our social statement. So it's not just a matter of resources, it's also a matter of what's the proper focus and what's the kind of social document that we need to develop. And uh, for that reason, Church and State is before you uh, with the recommendation of Church Council for uh, support as authorizing a social statement process. Thank you. Microphone seven. Jim Gonia from the Rocky Mountain Synod. As a synod with two advocacy offices, we spend quite a bit of time talking about the distinctiveness of our Lutheran witness to the gospel in terms of stepping into the public sphere and engaging with the government. I speak in favor of this uh, motion because I believe that although we have a wealth of resources in our tradition and our theology, we need to cull those and bring them together to teach and equip our own people for understanding why this matters so much. Thank you. Microphone 11. Mark Parker, Delaware, Maryland Synod, he, him, his. Uh, I move to postpone consideration of uh, this memorial until after the memorial uh, calling for a social statement on migrants and refugees. Is there a second? Let me speak to your motion. I would be happy to, and I look forward to the day in which a social statement is developed um, around uh, church and state um, 
as a, a student of political science, as somebody who has run for public office even while serving as a pastor, as somebody who's deeply engaged in the public life and the political life of the city of Baltimore, I think it's a critical um, issue and something of great importance. However, I don't feel if we are picking between um, options at the moment that it is one which rises um, to the top of our list of priorities. And so I would like to see our, uh, our body uh, consider and debate the merits of a social statement on migrants and refugees. If we go forward with that, great. If we don't, we can clearly return to this and move forward on this matter. Is there any uh, speaking to the motion to postpone? Microphone seven, is this to the, speaking to the motion to postpone? No. Okay, thanks. We'll, we'll get back to you then. Okay, um, I'll call on our resource person, the Reverend Dr. Roger Willer. I just want to clarify that the, the motion that is coming before the assembly is for a social message on migrants, not a social statement. It could be amended to be on social statement. Um, perhaps that's the question. But at this point, there's one on social statement, which is church and state. Um, and the other is a migrant um, request, and that's a social message. Depending on that, depends on the the uh, social teaching documents that we already have in place. So, to be clear, it's a social message and not a social statement. Is that what you're saying? On migrants, yes. On, on migrants, microphone eleven. Uh, yes, Mark Parker, eight F. I, I do appreciate the clarity on that. Um, uh, that's not actually, though, the full clarity. The, um, the request was made in the original memorial from Delaware Maryland Synod for a social statement. The recommendation back from the memorials committee was not for a social message, as you stated, but was in fact for uh, continuing the regular work of the church in the area of migrants and refugees because we already have an existing social message. So the recommendation from memorials was not to consider a social message, but was to uh, continue the work and uh, encourage and empower the work of the church in that area of ministry. Um, but to, to move forward with the existing social measures we have. Um, it is the intention of the authors from the Delaware Maryland Synod to, uh, to amend the recommendation from the Memorials Committee to push for a full social statement on migrants and refugees when it comes to the floor. Thank you. Any more speaking on the motion to postpone? Do you have further clarification? Pastor Willer? Yes. I just want to uh, agree with the previous speaker that um, it does not even call for a social message because we have several social messages on uh, immigration. Um, I was, I've was, i worked on all of the memorials that have to do with social statements or social messages and got that confused. So he, his point is correct. Thank you. Very good. Now, this, this will, okay, is this sp speaking against the motion to postpone? Microphone six. Cheryl Stewart, Florida Bahamas Synod, pronouns she, her, hers. I rise to oppose the motion to postpone. A social statement takes, as Dr. Weller said, five years or so to do, so it is an issue that needs time. The migrancy issue is indeed, the immigration issue is indeed immediate and important, and I think is more appropriate for a mess social message, which is a much shorter period of time, and we get more resources more quickly. I long for a social statement on church and state. I wish I had a dollar for every person I have had say to me, the church should not be involved in politics. I would love to have a teaching document for our people to ha lay out how we interact in the public square and therefore I would not postpone this uh, consideration of this adoption of the social message. I would urge us to vote against it and get back to this motion and adopt the social statement. Thank you. Microphone seven. Sonia Weir, um, Northeastern Pennsylvania Synod. I am speaking neither for nor against this right now. What I want to caution us is um, I'm seeing us starting to have a competition of social statements. And is, I thank, would I'm, like this to is, ask. This is out of order. I mean, your point well taken, but you have to speak either in favor of postponing or being opposed. Okay, then I will speak in favor of postponing and Very still good. make my point that I don't want to see a competition of social statements. My question for this would be, um, what power does this assembly have to um, authorize two social statements? Uh, two social statements, thank you. Hold on a minute, I'll get you the answer to that.
Thank you for that question. Um, this assembly does have the power to authorize as many social statements to be worked on at, the, at, at, at once, but the question is, is capacity of staff and finances. All right. Microphone eight. I'm Matthew Hazard, Southern Ohio Synod, and my question is, is it past 445? Because you said the Memorials Committee report would end at 445. Yes, it is. Thank you. Thank you. We'll call the orders of the day. Thank you very much. We'll bring the Memorials Committee back. If I think, was anyone standing in line at this point for? So remember where you were to speak particularly to this. Thank you very much. We're done. Thank you very much to Mr. Christofferson and, and Ms. Chapman. All right, let's take a moment where you are to stand and stretch. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. They're very talkative. Oh, oh my gosh. Oh, yeah. Oh. All right. Let's resume. Oh, I I was... do, do I need that one? No, this one. Please take your seats. We now consider non-germane resolutions that have been brought by the voting members and considered by the Reference and Council Committee. You will find the committee's report in Section 9 of the Pre-Assembly Report. The committee's co-chairs are Emma Wagner and Jim Jennings, both of the Church Council. Emma and Jim will guide us through the resolutions. Thank you. Good afternoon. The first resolution that we will consider is found, um, as the bishop said, um, motion A in our report, resolution to establish June 17th as Emmanuel 9 feast day of repentance. Therefore, be it resolved that the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America reaffirms its commitment to repentance from racism by venerating June 17th as a feast day of repentance in the ELCA for the martyrdom of the Emmanuel 9 and having the names of the Emmanuel Nine, Clementa Pigney, Cynthia Marie Graham Hurd, Susie Jackson, Ethel Lee Lance, DePayne Middleton Doctor, Twanza Sanders, Daniel Simmons, Sharonda Coleman Singleton, and Myra Thompson, added to future ELCA publications to venerate their martyrdom and lead us to repentance because of the white supremacy and racism in our church, and calling for this feast day to be grounded in prayer as the Emmanuel Nine were murdered while in prayer at the end of the Bible study, and directing the division on worship to help develop, develop future worship prayers and litanies around repentance from racism, and to encourage giving both prayer and financial support the memorial to be built in remembrance of the Emmanuel Nine, and be in deeper conversations with the AME Church on ways of reconciliation and repentance on the matters of white supremacy and racism. Our committee recommends adopting the resolution to establish June 17th as the Emmanuel Nine Feast Day of Repentance. It's before you're from the committee, there's no need for a second. Is there discussion about the resolution? Microphone 11. Michael Burke, South Eastern Iowa Synod. Uh, I rise to offer um, an amendment. Go ahead. Um, and I think the language is available, but on, on item number one, rather than venerate, venerating June 17th as a feast day, the language commemorating June 17th as a day of repentance, item number three, rather than calling for this feast day, calling for this commemoration to be grounded in prayer, and then in item number four, rather than saying direct, directing the division on worship to help, saying directing the office of the presiding bishop to help. Is there a second? You may speak to your amendment. This amendment does not seek to change the intent of the resolution, but to bring language that is consistent with language this church has historically used for such things. 
the language of commemoration and to rightly acknowledge that there is no division on worship, but there is a worship function within the office of the presiding bishop. Thank you. Further speaking on the amendment. Microphone five. Reverend Kwame Pitts, Metro Chicago Senate, and I am speaking on behalf of the committee who collaborated this resolution for a feast day of repentance for the Emanuel Nine. It is only when we are within the walls of our churches that we can wholly be ourselves, that we keep alive are you, a sense uh, Pardon me, Pastor. I'm sorry. Are, are, you, are you speaking in, in, in no. favor of the motion? I'm speaking against the motion. Then go over the red microphone. Okay. Or you could just stay there. We know what you're doing. I'm sorry, Pastor. <laughs> Shall I start over, Bishop? Yes, ma'am, please. Okay. Thank you. It is, in, it is only within we are, when we are within the walls of our churches that we can wholly be ourselves, that we keep alive a sense of personalities in relation to the total world in which we live, that we maintain a quiet and constant communication with, with all that is in deep within us. Hear the voice of Ancestor Richard Wright as reflected in the book, The Cross and the Litchie Tree by Ancestor Dr. James Cone. The black church is the place where we find, if no other, a sense of sacredness and affirmation of our humanity, and is where we are taught to open the doors and offer radical hospitality to anyone regardless. But on June 17, 2015, a man walked into the doors of Emmanuel AME Church and did not see the reflection of Jesus Christ in their faces, and with hatred and because of racism, murdered nine of our siblings in Christ a man who was a member of an ELCA church. One reason why my mother joined the ELCA is because of the richness of liturgy and worship. So how can we heal church? How can we make an actual powerful statement to the world about how we honor their memory and be empowered to live out our faith through action, then through our liturgy, through worship? As a woman as practical theologian and as a pastor in this church, I ask this assembly to pass the resolution. Ashe. Hmm. Thank you. We're now speaking specifically to the amendment and not to the entire uh, motion. Is there any speaking to the amendment? I don't see any. I see someone now. Yes, please, microphone five. Pastor Hans Becklin, member of the ELCA Church Council. Uh, I rise in favor of this amendment, Reverend Chair. I believe that in our church we have festivals, lesser festivals, and commemorations. And no greater martyrs in this church exist than those who shed their blood in Charleston, but they deserve to be listed among Dr. King and the other martyrs of this church as those commemorated. Thank you. Thank you. Microphone 8. I, uh, Pastor Jennifer Crean, Southwest California Synod. Um, I wish to speak against the amendment. I'm very much in favor of the motion, and I'll be over there in a minute. Um, I think that we should respect the work that has been done by um, Reverend Pitts, as well as others, their names are listed, um, who drafted this resolution. They used the language that they meant to use. And I don't think that we should be changing it. I think that we should be uh, voting on the motion as it was presented. Thank you. Microphone 11. Point of order, Pastor Chris from Delaware, Maryland Synod. Could we please see the amended text that we're considering right now? Because it's still showing the original text on the screen. It's coming right up. Thank you.
So while we're, we're, we're getting it up on the street, screen, it was uh, to, to change venerate to commemorate in one and venerate to commemorate in, pardon me? Oh, feast day, pardon me. And then uh, to change um, its office of the presiding bishop instead. We getting it? It's up before you. Is that clear now? What You're clear in what the amendment is. Commemorating June 17th as opposed to venerating, calling for a feast day, calling for this commemoration, and directing the office of the presiding bishop as opposed to directing the division on worship. Are we clear? Is there any more speaking uh, to this amendment? And I see microphone two. Where is the microphone to? Jerry Key from uh, Reformation Lutheran. Um, Key, sir, whatever. I'm not sure about that one. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I guess I just spent three hours in a conversation on this topic yesterday. People of European descent, you must understand if things are not comfortable for you, that probably means your privilege is talking. I don't mean any harm, but no, you no. need to, no, no. But we need to understand that those words were chosen very specifically by individuals who you could never understand what their life existence was. Please allow them to say what they need to say, and you figure out how to be comfortable with the words. Thank you. Is there, this will be the last one because we need to call the orders of the day. Is there any further speaking on the amendment? Microphone seven. Andreas Teich, Messiah Lutheran, Bay City, Northwest Lower Michigan Synod. I, I think the conversation here is about the language that the church uses to describe certain kinds of days. And feast day is not in the language of the ELCA, and there is no division of worship. And so the bishop's suggestion is that the language we use in the motion is language that is correct for the church. The intent of the folks is a whole other matter, and I think that's going to be discussed afterwards. Okay, thank you. Please remember where you are at your microphones, and we're going to have, no, remember where you are at the microphones, we're already past time, um, and make sure that our uh, volunteers can figure out where you are. Is this a point of order? Okay, thank you. No problem. All right. So we're going to close debate on the resolutions now. The resolutions will come back before you again. And now we're ready to move to the orders of the day, which at this point is an election report for the first ballot for secretary. I call on the chair of the Elections Committee, Tom Cunniff, for the report of the first ballot for secretary.
here, here's the thing, Church. Um, there was a motion there, I think it was a, it was a request that we not announce the results before they're published. We're having trouble getting this up, the screen to open. So would you consider it publishing if it were come to the, from the very lips of our general counsel as opposed, and we'll get this as soon as we can and post it? Is there any opposition? Okay, go ahead, Mr. General Sinclair. We're posting it to the guidebook. Thank you, Bishop Eaton. The ballot for the first ballot for secretary, there were 866 ballots cast. Five were illegal, 861 were legal. The number of votes required for election was 646. I'm asking that the be published a guidebook now. It should be available shortly and we will get it on the screen. But the top vote getter is 252 votes. We do not have an election. Thank you. The sec pardon me? There, oh there we go. Okay. And you can now see the results on the screen of the first page of the first ballot. You should have it in your guidebook shortly. It is five pages. Um, one note, you will note on the ballot that two members of the Elections Committee received votes on the first ballot. Both of those members are withdrawing, so there will be no conflict of interest in the Elections Committee. Thank you. The second ballot for secretary will take place tomorrow afternoon as there is no election. I would also remind you that any person who has been nominated may withdraw his or her name only at this time in the process. Once we proceed to the next ballot, no names may be withdrawn. Any person whose name is on the nominating ballot and who wishes to withdraw from further consideration is requested to go to the nomination desk outside of Hall C and fill out a form authorizing the withdrawal of your name on the next ballot. The nominations desk will be open from 5.30 to 6 o'clock p.m. tonight and open again from 8.30 to noon tomorrow. This is the only time when your name from, from, you may withdraw your name from the remaining ballots. If you know of people who have been nominated, please notify them. If they wish to withdraw, they can email their withdrawal to nominations at elca.org, or they can withdraw by telephone in the hearing of two members of the election committee. I don't know what the phone number is. Is this your personal cell? They can call they can call 773-380-2101. Thank you. That's his office phone. Thank you very much. And I'll call in Secretary Berger for announcements. This offering this morning's offering was five thousand and two dollars. Again, a reminder that you can contribute by credit card at the cashier's table or online. A reminder regarding the World Council of Churches Thursday in Black campaign, which calls upon the global ecumenical family to recommit to the ending of gender-based gender violence. The official launch of the ELCA's participation in the campaign will occur at tomorrow's plenary. You are reminded to wear black tomorrow along with your button, which was put on your table, will be put on your table tomorrow morning. You are also invited to participate in our social media strategy as we invite the whole church to, by, to join us by using hashtags Thursday is in black and ELCA, hashtag ELCA. Tomorrow you can find a banner in the hallway outside the plenary hall that can be used for your selfies. We'll also be taking a group photo of the plenary hall during the morning plenary. Thank you for your participation in tomorrow's launch. Let's watch a brief video on this announcement. It's Thursday in black. One in three women today experience physical or sexual violence. More than eight out of ten girls experience street harassment before they are 17. One in four children under the age of five live in a household experiencing domestic violence. Millions of women and men, boys and girls in every country, every community, every sector suffer rape, 
abuse, violence. But this is not about victims. This is about resistance. Resilience. Solidarity. Thursdays in work. Join the global movement for a world without rape and violence. There is, as you know, the receptions at the Art Museum this evening. The buses for tonight's transportation to the Art Museum will depart from the first floor by the ballroom beginning at 530. These are the same doors you took for the Amparo Walk. The buses will run continu a continuous loop until 7 p.m. The buses will be departing the Art Museum at 8.30 p.m. to your individual hotels and will run in a continuous loop until 10 p.m. Exhibits and bookstores are open until 7 p.m. tonight and until 2.30 Thursday afternoon, so plan to stop by. Again, as we said the other day, we want you to demonstrate your participation, support, and cooperation with the volunteers. And we also would remind you that those serving us in the hotels do, do deserve our tips, so you might want to tip your hotel housekeeping staff. Good. I'm talking about your money, not just your hands. Okay, uh, deadlines. Tomorrow noon is the time to withdraw from the ballot of secretary if you were on one of the five pages. And you remember the voting machine announcement. Pull out your card and pass your voting machines to your right. That concludes the announcements, Bishop. That's it. Thank you. Before we um, end the day, we have a special announcement from the campaign for the ELCA. Pastor Glusenkamp. Thank you, Bishop Eaton. On February 1st, 2014, the ELCA embarked on a courageous and unprecedented journey. Through always being made new, the campaign for the ELCA, this church committed to investing in its future deepening relationships and expanding ministries that serve our neighbors and communities in the United States and all around the world. With the goal of raising $198 million by June 30th, 2019, we focus campaign efforts on four priority areas, congregations, hunger and poverty, global church, and leadership. This goal represents a 64% increase in designated funding for these new and existing ministries. And since the campaign's launch, ELCA ministries have witnessed amazing generosity, leading to incredible growth across this church. The support of leadership groups, including the Churchwide Assembly, its voting members, was critical to the success of the campaign. Thank you for your efforts to tell the story of this church and for encouraging deeper engagement in the campaign for the ELCA. Now the hat I have here has an M on it, and the M stands for the great city of Milwaukee. It also stands for museum, where we invite you for a party this evening. It also stands for money your tithes and your offerings and gifts that have been so significant, it stands for million, and together we could raise $250 million. But most important of all, the M stands for mission and ministry and the impact here in the United States and all around the world. And M also stands for mixer, mashup and meeting to, to show our gratitude 
we would like you to join us for a reception at the Milwaukee Art Museum from 6 o'clock this evening to 8.30 p.m. We will celebrate the completion of this first comprehensive campaign and the impact we've made together since its launch in 2014 in this iconic setting. We will end the evening with a special surprise, fireworks over Lake Michigan. So food, fellowship, and fireworks. As Bishop Eaton likes to say, the M stands for more. Together, we can do more. <laughs> Shuttle buses are available, as, Bishop, as uh, Secretary Berger said, from the center here, beginning at 5.30 to take you to the venue. They will drop you off afterwards, either at the Hilton or the Hyatt. More information is available in your guidebook. We hope to see all of you there for heavy appetizers and drinks and a lot of really good fun. Thank you for supporting the campaign for the ELCA. Thank you, Pastor Glusenkamp. Um, I'm going to call, I call now on uh, Seth Zimmon, a member of the Church Council, to lead us in a closing hymn and prayer. Let's take a moment of silence before we begin. Please stand and turn to page 19. We'll be singing God's work, Our Hands. pray. We give you thanks, God of wisdom, 
for the ways you direct our days, each one a gift from you. We give thanks for teachers and mentors who have nurtured and challenged us in faith and love, for teachers and administrators at our ELCA seminaries, colleges, and other learning institutions, for students in their learning, and for all who have encouraged us to seek, wonder, question, and serve. In these days of assembly and always, school us in your ways, which are not our ways. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our wisdom and strength. Amen. We are in recess until 8.30 tomorrow. Thank you.